who is the Netflix CEO, who said Netflix's most formidable competitor is the human need for sleep. That's what we're complete, competing with on the margin is the human need for sleep. And just like you, when I first read that quote, you know, you sort of have that moment where you sit back in your chair. I sat back in my chair. But, and she said, she said, our most popular major right now is a combined major of psychology and computer science. I was struck. I think that's one of the things that we're losing out on, which is why it's so important to also have conversations with our kids about what it means to really put away the phone, sit down, feel your feelings, talk about it, IRL, and to really... Well done. <laughs>
people take time to open up it takes time to establish a relationship of trust with your therapist um there's so much complexity that goes on um but our attempt was to really present in short stories what the upside of therapy can be like and also say that it doesn't always work yes um i i know what you mean because i think very often we think of it as sort of like a magic bullet or a silver bullet that you know once you get into that room once you get into the couch once you find your therapist everything will be cured um but i really enjoyed that i i i think that fairy tale ending or that fairy tale sort of um myth that we have about therapy it's a dangerous one and uh, and i enjoyed that about the book where you say you know what sometimes i mean i'm i'm using my own words but the idea being that sometimes this is just a cross that one has to bear uh obviously you find tools to deal with it and um you find your triggers around it but sometimes these are just the legacies we carry in our bones and in our bodies and i appreciated the non fairy tale ness yeah. um of your book yeah 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 you know when you say uh, that we carry it in our bodies that was actually a strange point of connect i found between our books you know because on the face of it one book is about psychotherapy and yeah. the other book is about parenting in the digital age right yeah but uh, it struck me that both books are about emotional well-being at the core of it mm. they are about how do we thrive in this world there are issues which are in common such as what self worth means what human connection means what relationships mean so there's there's really a lot that i found uh, in common and as i was reading i was taking note of so many things in your book which actually one can look at from a psychological lens. Mm. Surprisingly the first one that I wrote down was oh yeah sleep. I was very struck by that comment. I think it was made by someone very senior at Netflix. You had quoted Net- them as Netflix saying, CEO. Netflix yeah. CEO uh said it it was it yeah go on. The, the quote it, that really uh it really shook me because his quote was along the lines of we consider our competition as netflix to be sleep okay and i was like oh my god <laughs> yeah this is the way that they're really thinking about it netflix's competition is sleep and sleep is such a basic part of our vitality of our well being it's it's really being compromised and if that's the mindset at which these brains are coming at us then we would do well to be aware of it and the reason that sleep struck me was that even when it comes to talk therapy we take a lot of things for granted like we assume we tend to assume that our clients will have the basics in place good nutrition decent exercise and of course sleep and um uh, i'm exposed to the impact of what lack of sleep can do to relationships to your own right. health to your mood to how you show up so that was i i thought that was a weird point of connect but yeah broadly both absolutely well absolutely i think the comment you're referring to is the netflix ceo who said netflix's most formidable competitor is the human need for sleep that's what we're complete, competing with on the margin is the human need for sleep and just like you when i first read that quote you know you sort of have that moment where you sit back in your chair i sat back in my chair and i said okay that's what it is now at this point when we're up against big tech our kids are up against big tech nothing is off limits nothing is off limits anymore nothing is sacred anymore not even the most basic building block of human of human life which is the ability to go to just rest yeah. switch it all off and rest and and don't we we see it don't we and it makes you reflect on your own sort of um watching and binging habits you know this uh this brings me to the theme of addiction right another place where psychology and uh, what we're talking about in terms of the digital world really do intersect and uh, uh, the other quote that hit me hard from your book was along the lines of how the best brains in the world are the ones who are behind these tech companies and this really using a combination of psychology and computer science to keep us hooked and uh, the analogy of how they actually see how dogs are trained by using the clickers yes and taking things from that yeah i mean, I, i remember feeling like a sense of 
real uh, dehumanization like we are like that in some ways aren't we Just... and control and loss yeah. of control you know it's it's that thing where we think we're controlling our clicks but we're not anymore and as the tech gets more advanced and especially now with the advent of ai there is actually a huge loss of control um so you know the the part that you're talking about it first struck me when i was having a conversation with someone very senior in the leadership of my us college which was 100 years ago when i went to college but but even so but even so and i was having a conversation with her and i was asking her you know what's going on these days what are what are what are what are the kids sort of um, leaning towards and she said she said our most popular major right now is a combined major of psychology and computer science i was struck uh when she said that and i looked it up not only not only my alma mater but yale's doing it you pen is doing it some of the top universities in the world are doing it and the idea is to really create this um sort of this blend of of um of practices this blend of disciplines because now it's no longer about just someone learning how to code or on or knowing how humans think it's about bringing those two disciplines together so i want to know how you think and then i want to know how to code so i can really hack that neural pathway and create then this incredibly sort of like sticky encompassing uh world for you where every click leads you to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and as advertising gets more targeted you don't know it but you're sucked in you know everything you could possibly want is is on a device and interestingly you know uh yash where where we're really seeing the sort of effects of that is on teenage pregnancy so teenage pregnancy all over the world is at an i'm sure you know this is at an all time low right and a lot of this is because of course there's better information out there kids know what they're doing of course they do but a lot of it is also because kids aren't experiencing real intimacy um anymore there's um there's access to 24/7 high def porn um and then there's the whole online dating thing with her, which has really taken off and folks like you know i i i suspect like you and me who haven't grown up entirely online we see this as different worlds you know dating someone online versus dating someone IRL in real life but for a lot of kids what's the difference yeah and it really struck me that that was another thing that uh, that really struck me yeah. oh no you know go, go back to one point which you mentioned about uh, the way that these brains are really coming at us to keep us hooked yeah then i mm. that i also want to speak to what you just said about this uh, the, the world of virtual dating right yes on that first one you know one might think that well then what hope do we have the best brains in the world i knew the latest developments in psychology and the digital world being designed intelligently to keep us hope what what hope do us mere mortals have but that's a yeah. part that you know your book is like a beacon of hope because one of the things you said which i love is that we as parents we may feel like we don't quite get what's going on but that phrase digital immigrants i thought yes. it was a hopeful one because i also come from a time when we were allowed to get bored where we were playing you know climbing trees skinning our knees all of that stuff and i think that the boredom i experienced as a kid was where my creativity came from i've written so many books i used to read extensively had a very rich fantasy world and so i think that uh, we are uniquely positioned to bring some of what has been lost in today's world into the lives of our kids but like immigrants we do need to learn the language and your book really helped me learn a yeah. few terms irl of course being one but many things which i had no idea yes yeah, if you didn't know irl before coming into this then you and i need to talk okay that is basic stuff my friend there's a lot more coming your way I There's know. a lot more coming your way. I know. No, I feel no. a little ashamed right now, but yeah. Not at all. We'll 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 do a fun quiz at some point, and we'll and we we'll, we'll gauge your level of uh, of of Gen Z slang. Yeah. But no, look. I mean, uh, I think in seriousness, the truth is that that um, 
that the smartest world in the world, the smartest brains in the world are looking to create the stickiest online experience possible. And I say that because sometimes we beat ourselves up about this, you know, we beat ourselves up about how much time we're spending online, how much time our kids are spending online, how addicted we are to our phones. You know, this is all to say, look, look at what you're up against. You know, there's literally an army out there with the deepest pockets in the world, armed with the most cutting edge tech, and all they're trying to do is keep you hooked. So don't beat yourself up about it. But but I am hopeful. I really genuinely am. Two reasons. One, because, you know, uh, in all my research, I came to realize that as parents, we don't have to keep up with every single thing. You know, it's not about knowing every single keystroke that your that your that your kid is entering or every single uh, as much as I joke with you about Gen Z slang. It's not about us knowing every single word that they're using. It's about us just teaching them digital hygiene. You know, we don't ultimately we're trying to raise adults, not children. Right. And 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 I think that was, you know, honestly, it was liberating for me as a parent to realize that I don't have to put that kind of pressure on myself to keep up every single step of the way. And the second thing that makes me very hopeful, Yash, is the realization that that these kids, you know, what whatever, Gen Z, I Gen, the app generation, whatever you want to call them, these kids know. They know that what they're seeing, I mean, sometimes they'll need help in, in, in um, realizing that the lines are blurry. But in general, they know that a lot of what they're seeing on social media isn't real. They know what happens when you're not socializing in real life and you're addicted to your phone all the time. You know, they're, they're aware of it. So, and, and one of the, the, the times that I realized that is that while folks like you and me are still on Instagram, a lot of the kids are on an app, for example, called Be Real, where you're actually penalized if you upload an edited photo. You know, so they're they're aware of this, and 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 I think if 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 we work together, you know, and bring in our lessons of what it's like to what you were saying, uh, live a more analog life, climbing the trees, skinning your knees and they bring in their knowledge of tech. I mean, I think we could have a wonderful experience, both both parents and kids. The fact that we now, we always have a distraction, right? It's, it's one phone screen away. Um, I think one of the things from a psychotherapeutic perspective is when we do not allow ourselves to sit with our uncomfortable feelings, to really feel our pain fully, to make meaning of it. It could be with dialogue with another, it could also mean just actually sitting with it ourselves. The human emotions of anger, grief, sadness, fear, they are all a part of the portfolio of our, our inner world and our relational world. And I think that that's one of the things that's really getting compromised when you're able to just quickly distract yourself. So I think that's one of the things that we're losing out on, which is why it's so important to also have conversations with our kids about what it means to really put away the phone, sit down, feel your feelings, talk about it, IRL, and to really... Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to really experience, to experience the full range of our emotions is a part of our emotional well-being and psychological health. I agree and again this is something that came up in, in while writing this book is is act sort of lack of discomfort that that are that we're that we're allowing our kids to feel. I I almost inoculating them against everything. You know, we'll all, obviously we'll all do the inoculations against or take the vaccines against um you know, preventable disease, but I feel like we're also trying to inoculate them against any kind of failure, any kind of discomfort. And that's a scary thing because, you know, when your phone, exactly what you're saying, I'm agreeing violently with you, you know, when your phone is there, so when you're, instead of when you're breaking up with someone, instead of sitting down and having that real conversation about what went wrong, you know, what you're feeling right now, um, the sadness, the grief, the loss, uh, perhaps hope for the future, whatever, you know, rainbow of emotions one feels during a, uh, during a breakup. 
Now it's so easy to just send a text message, block, delete contact. It's done, you know, and in that transaction or lack of, imagine that entire like universe of of emotion that you haven't allowed yourself to feel. And I wonder then if it has sort of a build up effect later on, like what do you think is happening or what do you think I'm, I suppose I'm asking you to peek into the future because this is something that I've discovered in my research that I know where we're, we're trying to prevent our kids to, pre- to, to feel discomfort and that phone is right there to help them with that. But what do you think it leads to as this generation grows into adults and really hasn't felt fear, failure, discomfort of any kind what's the problem with that is that okay yeah it's most definitely not okay and i'm thinking about something that you referenced right which is the age of people viewing kids viewing porn i was shocked as young as 10 mm. yeah i was in india in the us it's younger like 10 year olds really you know um so the exposure is really really high and um, you know this whole piece about not having a real connection and taking the easy way out stuff like breaking up over text blocking and then quickly also moving on to the next person yes there's no real assimilation there's no real growth that's taking place there's no real learning about what it means to be in a relationship there's mm. a best opportunity to get feedback on how you show up as a person um and so it's very possible that our kids don't learn what it means to really relate and to have a relationship which is not a fantasy relationship but something that takes effort takes work i think the biggest thing being compromised there is the idea that relationships are hard relationships take work and relationships are worth it but they need the effort so one of the things that struck me was i think you quoted uh, you said a statement around your primary partner can never compete can never win yeah. against a fantasy relationship a fantasy yeah. relationship yeah. and and the digital world really enables fantasy relationships isn't it yeah you know that came from um uh that came from this 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 sort of story that i found where virtual girlfriend she'll be whatever you want her to be you know on tuesday she's the dominatrix on wednesday she's a submissive school girl on thursday she's she does she's someone else and and she changes roles and she can really become whatever you need her to be um in that moment and um i think it was a new york times story that uh, that that i was reading and you know as i began to research this sort of phenomenon of of dating of dating someone online who can really take on these different roles um it became clear i i i think i quoted someone from the psychotherapy world who said look when you're comparing that relationship that fantasy relationship to someone in real life it's never going to match up because i mean doesn't every married couple know that ultimately the novelty wears off right and you're left with sort of the work um to do to keep the newness the freshness the excitement still alive but what happens online is you can keep inventing that newness and you can keep inventing that excitement whether it's the same person taking on different roles whether it's moving on from one person to the next and it becomes easy you know um i worry for the kids only because for them oftentimes they experience this fantasy before they experience real adult real intimacy you know as adults we know uh what or at least we think we know what 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 intimacy is or is about and sometimes it's clumsy and awkward and you know uh, not less than perfect but when you're for example in a fantasy relationship with someone online it could be someone who's a professional or not or you know your 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 needs are being met by say porn or someone in a chat room it's it's so easy to dispense with um with the realness of it all and and the worry for the kids is that they'll experience that before they experience um real intimacy i think it was a a adult movie star i mean i absolutely adore this line she said teaching your kids 
learning sex, learning about sex from porn is like having Vin Diesel teach your kid how to drive. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that just brought it home for me because you don't drive on the streets like you would if you were in Fast and Furious, right? You're going to get yourself killed. So so when our kids are learning about intimacy from porn without without any sort of context for it it's it's like Vin Diesel teaching them how to drive and you know again i i just want to sort of make this clear none of this is my uh, is 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 any sort of an argument against porn i think it can be a wonderful thing but the idea is that it should be responsibly enjoyed by people who have context for it during covid and actually subsequently almost all of my work now is online so i i'm right. working with so many people from different parts of the world as their therapist and that kind of access would not have been possible so it's also a huge opportunity it's 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 it and it is actually a connection and i was very heartened uh, to read that that one of my favorite authors the psychotherapist uh, Irvin Yalom he um, says that in his experience zoom therapy is actually as effective as his in person therapy really so yeah so there's something we may be losing out on in terms of not being in the same room the energy you know the possibility for just that physical connection and observance of body language in its entirety but there's something that does get added back maybe from the fact that people are able to log in from the comfort and safety and convenience of their own home maybe they are able to feel like themselves in a safe environment even in the conversation for therapy so yeah definitely there's there's a lot of the absolutely good. and and that research is actually being mirrored um uh, by emerging research around education where um a lot of the research is showing that online classes especially in large groups is actually just as effective as as um as sitting in sort of like you know a 50 people classroom you could achieve the same dynamic whether it's um being able to ask a question whether it's being able to connect with a peer you can achieve the same dynamic being online so so of course you lose some you lose some of the of the of the human connect the sort of you know a flesh and blood connect of course you do but again i think the the upside of it the being able to connect the um you know it there's there's a lot of there's a lot of great that comes out of it 100% i couldn't agree more also thinking about uh, something interesting that you said which is our kids know they know right they they sharp they sensible they're exposed right they're not maybe as clueless as and innocent as we were when we were growing up thanks to that exposure but they are smart inherently we can't trust them but at the same time uh, you quoted this research about how teenage girls when exposed to edited photos the impact on their brains you see, and and again you use the word trauma trauma being caused to their brains just by the simple act of viewing photos that they know by the way to be edited you know so there's also the fact that yeah they may know but at one level they may not realize the impact of what it actually do to their yeah. self at a very at a very subconscious level so there is also that fact a 100% you know i think the the research that you're that you're referring to is by a british researcher m ford and and what she found is that when they did mri scans of young girls who were viewing airbrushed photos of models exactly the kind of photos that you and i see and everyone sees on instagram every day they were actually experiencing those mri scans show that these young girls were experiencing trauma and and um it's a it's a difficult space it's a difficult space because you know i i want to i want to share something with you i i write about it in the book as well but i want to share it here with you i um i went through an eating disorder when i was growing up as a teenager and i grew up in the 90s well before the advent of the internet now i say that and i talk about my experience only to sort of use that as a data point to show that the internet did not invent toxic beauty standards unattainable sizes size 0 this has been around you know and as a lot of young women and young girls you talk about it in your book um where you know you you come across stories of 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 young girls who have been fat shamed by their own parents their own mothers for instance so you know this has been around this this the cycle of trauma has been around for a while but there's something different happening now 
you know earlier it used to be almost a private affliction that you that you dealt with now what's happening for example there are entire communities online that worship what they call anna and mia anorexia and bulimia I was just and these that young was frightening for me too i mean i was like, i saw the heading anna and mia and i was like oh who are these people and then i read on and i was just blown away yeah that was scary there is this tsunami that is now uh coming coming on that 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 a young girl has to deal with when she's coming online and um and it's and it's it's very difficult and we've seen it right i'm sure you're seeing it in your practice the the sort of incidence of these eating disorders has skyrocketed uh mental health is at an all time low and i know i know you know um the difference between correlation and causation but there's something happening online especially with social media that is sending these young girls into a tizzy yeah 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 there's definitely something happening happening online that's compounding what the effect of toxic messages might have been and uh, you did say that one of the stories that you enjoyed in our book what stood out for you was a story called laddus and love which is about um a young girl who has been fat shamed by her own mother um and as i was thinking about that i realized that some of our work in psychotherapy when it comes to something like an eating disorder is to people actually get this internal permission that i can eat what i want when i want you know mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that they're going to go and binge but it's more like the internal permission to be able to do so to have that basic control on their bodies their lives and that stands in sharp contrast to one of the quotes from this anna and media mia community that you mentioned which is i shall not want food and that yes. becoming like an anthem for a bunch of young girls so yeah that that was hard hitting and i think things that hit hard are useful because they grab your attention and attention means that it comes into your conscious awareness and awareness is really the first step towards making any change that's mm. what we in psychotherapy as well that when an aware, when a pattern comes into awareness mm. you then have the ability to think differently or to change a behavior so that's what i really enjoy about your book which is as scary and as hard hitting as as it is um it's hard to forget some of these things that you've quoted and that's actually useful in having what ends up being not a very you know sort of hyper conversation with your kids yeah but but one where you do recognize the dangers of what is out there and then are able to say hey let's moderate it 100% we we both enjoyed each other's work and 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 it's it's sort of coming out as we're speaking now but it's exactly that right it's about telling stories which is what you've done in your book as well because you know you can quote all the research in the world but nothing is as memorable as as telling someone a story and and uh, that is absolutely something i try to do in eye parent as well is try and bring alive as many stories as i could as i spoke to to kids and the parents um all across the country so it was it was absolutely something that um, that brought it all home for me and i was just also thinking about uh, in a world where uh, you know your attention is scarce it's hard to hold attention one of our strategies for our book has been actually to take 50 stories from our clinical practice yes rather than let's say you know 10 case studies which would have been much longer the attempt really was to say that if each is a stand alone story in itself it's like something that can be consumed bite sized bite sized and uh, yeah I-, i do feel like as a long time reader this one of the things i feel really sad about is that my own my own ability to read is so yeah. deeply compromised now because of my phone and my computer and various other digital devices if i may i want to switch gears and i want to tell you an interesting story and get your take on it so you know there's this whole um advent of how woke and how um how woke gen z and and um and and this generation really is and how people are finding new identities which is all very wonderful and being inclusive which is fantastic 
I want to ask you if in your sort of almost professional opinion are we taking it a step too far and I, let me contextualize my question so I was sitting with um, a bunch of parents the other day and one of them told us a story she said that in one of the more prestigious schools that we that we know of uh, there's a couple of kids in the school who now identify as wolves right um, you might have heard about this you know epic kids are now identifying as tables and chairs and cats and dogs and so there's a couple of wolves now in the school it's a very prestigious school and the school doesn't want to be cancelled so what they have done is that these two students have been given 10 minutes scheduled um in the middle of the school day to go outside and howl because they are identifying as wolves and you know as this as as this parent told us the story the rest of us just sort of sat back for a moment not knowing uh really what to what to make of it because a lot of this for us as parents is new right what do you what do you do when your child comes home one day and says i identify as a cat you know today from today onwards i am a furry i am a cat please call me cat um and i will walk on fours and i will meow and you know all the rest of it i know some of this is about identity action and you know and, and all the rest that comes with it when you're when you're seeing in your teens but do you think that we're almost as a society going a step too far in in being this inclusive that now we've got kids howling in schools yeah. as wolves i think it's a very complex and nuanced topic isn't it the the topic of identity because on the one hand we want to be able to let our kids be who they want to be on the other hand there's no denying that there is the idea of taking things too far and are these brains mature enough to really handle all the information and all the exposure that they're getting from the world around them yeah some of the things that i see and I, without context i don't want to you know comment too deeply on an issue like kids howling in school which on the face of it sounds really odd um but i can tell you that again the combination of digital and information about psychotherapy really has the potential to be misused because there's also so much mis- misinformation out there i have clients who are confused about whether they should be self diagnosing uh terms like gaslighting are just getting thrown around without a real understanding of the meaning of it and people are using labels both to pathologize themselves and others and mm. all of this is a function of i would say a lot of irresponsible over exposure and people out there creating content and putting it putting it in the public sphere without much much of any sort of ethical responsibility or control mechanism yeah so it, it is quite a mind field isn't it it's tough it's really tough i mean as a as a parent it's exactly it's exactly that on one hand you want to you know you don't want to limit your child you want them to have freedom of expression of self expression but on the other hand you you know your own sort of almost shall i say common sense kicks in and you say wait a minute buddy are you Uh, you know what's this about um where is this coming from and uh, and again you know i i i i think i i deliberately picks a provocative story but to drive a particular point home that no one has ever parented like this before you know no one has parented an entirely online generation with both the fantastic parts of it and the challenges that come you know all bundled together it's like a it's like a happy meal you know you you get it all bundled together you can't have one without the other and and no generation has really parented uh, an online an online generation before so this is it's new and i feel like all of us are subjects in this massive social experiment with no control group and while we scrounge around for answers i think the truth is we're just going to have to wait and see think, how it all turns out i think so by definition if this is the first time this is ever happening in the history of the world we don't know how it will evolve it's exciting and scary times 
and therefore it's not about the right answers but it is about maybe some of the ingredients that can make it a sensible conversation that can make it a conversation in the first place uh, moderation awareness all the stuff that we've been talking about and we just cross our fingers and forge ahead and hope for the best there we go <laughs> thanks very much yash i think this was an incredible conversation and i've enjoyed i don't know about anyone else but i've enjoyed every minute of it i enjoyed every minute too and i enjoyed your book i highly recommend it and uh, yeah it's a very important piece of work so thank you once again for putting it down thank you yash